UFC Fight Night Vegas 88 to Ivasa versus Tybura takes place this weekend and I'm going to go through the entire card starting with the early prelims, ending with the main event, giving my prediction and breakdown for every single fight on the card, starting with the early prelim opener of Sharalampos Gregorio versus Chad Anheliga. I'm going to go with Chad Anheliga to win this fight in an upset. I know he's taken this on short notice, but I still think he's got what it takes to beat uh, Sharalampos Gregorio because... I don't like Sharalampos Gregorio's game. I don't think he's going to KO Chan ha Chad Anheliga early. I don't see that happening here. He could, of course. There's a chance he could. He's a wild guy. He throws. I've seen him throw flying knees. I've seen him throw some unorthodox techniques. Um, but Chad Anheliga is a tough dude. He's always going to give you a tough fight. Um, he fought Muin Gafarov on the Contender Series and won. And I know Muin Gafarov ended up not really being anything that great, but he was a great prospect at the time with a great record. And Chad Anheliga worked him over the distance. Then beat Jesse Strader in his debut. He has a win over Brady Highstand on the regional scene uh, before Brady Highstand went on to the uh, Ultimate Fighter. And since then, he's lost to Heli Alateng and Jose Johnson. They both beat him. But I think they're both very technically sound fighters with physical advantages over Chad Anhiliga. And I think they're very technically sound. Even though Heli Alateng has got a dirty looking record, he's a very crisp looking striker with fast twitch muscle, very good technique, very good timing. And uh, Jose Johnson's massive for the division, great grappler, great striker as well, dangerous on the feet. I mean, it looked like... They were three weight classes apart when they fought each other. Um, but these two are a lot closer in physicality. I think that's where Chad Anhelig is going to shine. And I've watched Sharon Lampos Gregorio's career. He's 8-3. and three, Okay. 8-3 and three record. 31 years old. Trains at a great gym at Longo and Weidman MMA. But his career is full of red flags. He takes a 6-5 and five short notice step up opponent in Chris Disonel to the fifth round. This Chris Disonel guy has fought worse, like mid-level competition on the regional scene and been smoked. He's been smoked by people. He's been beaten up by people and finished in the later rounds. But Chris Disonel takes him to the fifth round. The guy stepped in for your fight on short notice on the regional scene. Six and five record. Feeling on short notice. You take him to the fifth round and finish him with low kicks? I think that's a red flag. It's a massive, massive red flag. He's lost to Christian Rodriguez on the regional scene. That's not too bad. But he lost to eight and six, Josh Smith. Not a great look for him there either. Before the guy, he fought in Chris Dussanel. He fought a two and five opponent. You know, he beat Cameron Smotherman on the Contender Series and finished him in the first round, I understand, but I don't know, dude. I, d I don't really rate this guy too high, and Cameron Smotherman, like, he was coming off a split decision win over a 9-6 and six opponent on the regional scene. Like, this is all red flags to me. I think Chad Anahliga's tough. I don't think he's going to get finished, and I think if he doesn't get finished, he can out-consistent Shara Lampos Gregorio over the distance of this fight. I do not like Shari, uh, Shara Lampos Gregorio's look of his fighter profile so far. It just screams red flag to me. I'm taking the underdog. We move on. Jacqueline, and also, I watched this fight, Shara Lampos Gregorio. I guess it's going to be a longer prediction video because I'm doing my research these days. Um, I've watched his fights. Dude, he's slow. He's so slow. He's open on the feet. There was a fight he had. I'm going to go back to check on it. My voice is messed up today. I don't know what it is. Um, but his more recent fight that he had, I'm going to find it right now. Um... The more recent fight that he had on the uh, regional scene, not on the contender series, he fought Joey Chris Chrysostomo Jr. in April of 2022. By the way, this guy hasn't been too active, but either way, in April of 2022, he fought Joey Chris Chrysostomo Jr. And this guy who was two and five started to get like a bit of momentum in round two. I'm not saying he was winning round two. But if you watch the fight, you can see, hold on a second. You know what I mean? That was one of those moments. And again, this was a guy who filled in on short notice. And the guy went for a takedown at the same time that Gregorio went for a takedown. And Gregorio went for it last. So he ended up getting a better body weight advantage over Chad and Haliga and sort of just bodying him to the ground in like a weird rugby tackle type situation. Um, but then he started winning on top position. But before that, like, there was moments in the second round where I'm like, whoa, this is a two and five filling opponent, dude. Look better than this. 
I don't like it. I'm going with Chad and Aligo. We move on. Jacqueline Amorim versus Corey McKenna. Now I've spent five minutes on the early prelim opener. Jacqueline Amorim versus Corey McKenna. I'm going with Corey McKenna. I think she's uh, more talented out of the two of them. I don't think she's more talented. I disagree on that. I think Jacqueline Amorim is the better trained fighter. I think she's got more skill. I think Corey McKenna is going to have a strength advantage here and a physicality advantage as well. And I think she's going to have a stand-up advantage. Which I think is going to be a big deal here because one, I like Corey McKenna's grappling. I think it's okay. I think she's got good takedown defense. Two, I like her stand-up a bit better than I do Jacqueline Amorim. I think Jacqueline Amorim, just going to say it how it is, she's feminine. I know Corey McKenna is as well, but she's Welsh inbred feminine. So it's different levels of feminine. Jacqueline Amorim, very feminine woman. She's had locked-in chokes before in her career. I'm not over-exaggerating this. She's had locked-in, under-the-chin chokes in her career before. And she's failed them because she just doesn't have the strength to finish a locked-in, rear-naked choke in round one. She had three of them against Sam Hughes. And each time she got there, she just simply does not have the squeezability in her arms to do anything about having that submission position. I don't like it. I think she's a frail hollow boned bird woman I, I, i'm gonna go with i'm gonna go with uh Co cory mckenna i'm going with cory mckenna i think she's got better stand up i think she's a bit stronger i think she's a bit more physical a bit more inbred and a bit more masculine uh compared to jacqueline amorim so i'm taking her to win we move on can't believe she's got a 58 inch reach cory mckenna by the way 10 inch reach disadvantage here i still think she's gonna win we move on joshua kalibau versus danny silver I'm going with Danny Silver over Joshua Kalibau. I could be 0-3 to start off the card, but I'm, I'm, I'm coming in with some, some interesting takes here. Man, I liked Danny Silver's performance on the Contender Series. I liked it so much, I accused him of PEDs. And I'm still not sure he's not on him. The pace he pushed with the power punches he was throwing on the Contender Series against whatever that guy's name was, I can't quite remember it. But the pace he pushed was insane. I want to say it was something like Machado. Pacheco. I know not Machado. Just something like that. Pacheco. Who was great in that fight as well. And really wanted that win. Did not fade away. Did not shy away from anything. Really wanted that win. And recently in Joshua Kalibau's career. What you start having to do is. You start looking at his recent wins and losses. And just matchups in general. And you start applying today's logic to them. And when you do that, what you get is got mo smoked by Jalen Turner and manhandled. It is what it is. You know, what I mean, I'm not going to shame him for that. But he did get absolutely manhandled by him. It is what it is. He was fighting at lightweight on short notice. I don't care. The Charles Jordan fight. We kind of know Charles Jordan ain't top level anymore. We kind of know that Jordan is sort of just going to be that unranked guy by now. You know? We go on to 2021. Shali and Nerdy Mbeke who held him down for good portions of that fight, but Kalibau just did more damage and landed better shots on the feet. You know? Sung Woo Choi is garbage. Muay, Muay Thai national Korean champ, I don't care. He is garbage. Bottom level feed at featherweight in the UFC. And Kalibau's winning split decisions against him. Even while knocking him down, he's still making it a split decision. I don't like that. And then the uh, Melsic Bagdasarian fight. Bagdasarian gets hit, loses balance, uh, Kalibau jumps right on him, gets the rear naked choke. Amazing finish by Joshua Kalibau. He's not really a finisher in his career so far, but that was an amazing finish. Um, but before that, it looked like Melsic Bagdasarian, who again, I don't rate too highly myself, but he's all right, was piecing him up a little bit on the feet. He was starting to get momentum. I know he landed a groin shot or two, but he was starting to piece him up on the feet. And I think Danny Silva is capable of being UFC level. And I think he can beat Joshua Kalibau. You want to know why? Kalibau is Samoan, got them Polynesian genes, and I, I hate to generalize here, but he's soft-bodied, he's very soft-bodied, and I think Danny Silva can really land good body shots on him, because it was something that he did against Pacheco on the Contender Series extremely well, power shots to the body, on offbeat timing, in and out of exchanges, he was finding the body quite a bit, and then he was using it to find the head afterwards, and I think he's going to be able to find the body against Kalibau. And I think it's going to be a similar physicality between the two of them. 
It's saying that Danny Silver's taller. I think Kelly Bell's going to have a little bit of a height advantage. I don't think Danny Silver's taller. I think the heights are wrong. Um, but I think Danny Silver's got this one. I really do. I really think Danny Silver's got this one. He's tough. He's powerful. He's got insane endurance for how tough and powerful he is. I think he's on PEDs. If he's not, fair play to him. He's 27 years of age. He's younger. I'm going to take him to beat Joshua Kalibau here. And also, Joshua Kalibau did just take a fucking beating off Lerone Murphy in that third round and lost that fight pretty clearly as well and kind of got shown I'm the real featherweight contender in Lerone Murphy. Lerone Murphy was like, I'm the guy heading for the rankings, not you, little bro. You know what I mean? So I'm going to go Danny Silver. I'm going to take him in his debut here. We move on. Jafel Philho versus Ode Osborne. So this is a matter of, is Ode Osborne better than Mohamed Mikhaev? Because that's what I'm waiting to fucking find out in this matchup. And I, it better not be true that that's the case. I'm going Jafel Philho. Um, I think this is a no-brainer. Um, they're both similar in terms of level of competition. I know Jafel Philho's maybe fought better UFC fighters purely based on that Mikhaev fight. Um, but he fought Daniel Perez, finished him in the first round with an arm triangle. I like that. I think he dropped him in that fight as well. I've, I did some research on this card a while ago because some of the fights have changed on short notice, but I'm fairly certain he dropped him bad on his ass in that fight. I've got a vision of it in my head. Uh, he was like knocking him down, like maybe even, oh no, no, Perez dropped Philho and then Philho got the sub. That's interesting. I knew someone got dropped and then the sub happened. I am still going to go with Philho though and I actually kind of like that more. He got concussed, he got hurt, he still got his takedown and got his fucking sub. And Perez is no joke in wrestling. I know Perez. He is no joke in wrestling. If Perez is that Spanish dude, then I know Perez. Yes, he is. Fighter out of Valencia, Spain. This guy has got great wrestling. Amazing, amazing wrestling. He's, I, I really do rate that, that he managed to get a takedown on this guy while concussed and got his submission. I'm going to go Jafel Filho. Nearly submitted Mohamed Makayev as well. And Ode Osborne seems to have a bit of a vulnerability when it does hit the ground. And I've just never been impressed by Ode Osborne throughout his entire career. I mean, you know, lost to Brian Kelleher, got subbed immediately in round one. Uh, beat CJ Vergara, arguably fucking lost, and uh, I think should have lost. Um, Manel Cap smoked him, easy. And we've seen Manel Cap struggle with, like, Felipe Dos Santos, who we found out isn't really that good. And Cap smoked him immediately in that fight with a flying knee. He beat Jerome Rivera, the worst UFC flyweight ever signed in the history of the sport. That's a win, I guess, for him. Tyson Nam smoked him in a round. You know, like, we can go through this. Zaruk Adeshev, sorry, I take it back. He's the worst lightweight ever signed to the UFC. Zaruk Adeshev and Jerome Rivera are the two worst flyweights, maybe worst signings, other than, of course, CM Punk and some outliers, that the UFC has ever done, especially at flyweight. And Ode Osborne's only two good wins are against them. And other than that, he's lost. Smoked my Babayev in round two and dominated on the ground. I thought Charles Johnson fucking beat his ass. I thought Charles Johnson won that fight. Like, I've never seen a clear good win that I respect from Ode Osborne. And I've respected Philho more. So I'm going to go with Jafel Philho. I reckon he'll be able to find his submission at some point in round one or two. We move on. Up the card. Josian Nunes versus... And also, Ode Osborne's 32. Like, it's not like he's a young prospect anymore. Josian Nunes versus Chelsea Chandler. Now, if this was at featherweight... I wouldn't mind Chelsea Chandler's chances of just simply mogging Josie Ann Nunes. You know what I mean? Not having to cut as much weight, um, being a bit beefier out there. Maybe not trying to run through the cage like she did last time against Norma Jamont. But she looked lost against Norma Jamont, man. Lost against Norma Jamont. No stand-up ability whatsoever. And that's what I'm worried about here, man. That is what I'm worried about here. I don't like that she's taking this fight at bantamweight. Bantamweight, I think, is better for Nunes here. She's five foot two. Chelsea Chandler's five foot seven, and it's not like Chelsea Chandler's lean and mean. Let's just say that, okay? She's got some chunk to her, okay? Um, I'm gonna go Josie Ann Nunes. Lethal hands, way shorter with a similar reach. We know how that goes. Volk Holloway, hello. It's always a problem with that type of style matchup. And uh, this time Nunes has got wicked power in her hands. I know she has had moments where I'm like, oh, I didn't really like that one. Like the Ramona Pascal performance, I feel like it was, where I was like, hmm. No, the Zara Fendor Santos performance, wasn't it? That was one That was one where it was a bit... Uh. But I think Chelsea Chandler is so unbelievably open on the feet. She throws punches with her eyes closed. 
And Josie Ann Nunes is going to catch her on the chin with manpower. So I'm going to go with Josie Ann Nunes getting this one done by TKO in round two. We move on. Natan Levy versus Mike Davis. Oh my God, he fucking returns. When you least expect him, Mike Davis returns. I haven't seen him in three years. Thanks, Mike Davis. Come back, ruin a prospect and dip for two years. That's all you do. What's up? What's going on, Mike Davis? I'm sick of it. This guy is wicked at fighting. Amazing at fighting. He has free hospitality at Tiger Muay Thai because he won the Muay Thai competition there. And he, uh, he won the Muay Thai open tournament there to get into Tiger Muay Thai. He went through the Muay Thai trials of Tiger Muay Thai to get in. And he won. He's wicked. Six stand up. I think Mason Jones is a beast. I really do think Mason Jones is a beast. And right now, what's Mason Jones doing? Which is basically the last good win of Mike Davis, by the way. Um, what is Mason Jones doing? He's bullying the regional scene right now. I don't know if you guys are paying attention to Mason Jones' career outside the UFC. He's literally just taken on all comers. And he's bullying the regional scene. But they are not landing gloves on him. He is bullying them. And I think that's aged very well for Mike Davis. Beat Borshev. Took him down. Showed his grappling skills in that fight. And Borshev's a nasty striker. We know this. I really like this for Mike Davis. And the fact that he takes so much time off. Let me know if you think I've got a good point here. The fact that he takes so much good time off. Is because. The fact that I think it's good that he takes so much time off. Is because it kind of guarantees that when he does fight. He must be in good, in good shape and healthy. Right? Like, he ain't been around for two years. That tells me, you like, he's been trying to fight, but he's been injured, and now he's good. I would hope. I hope it's not like, oh, it's been two years, I need a fucking paycheck. You know what I mean? I've got to, I've got to pay my fucking chicken biryani off at, uh, at uh, Tiger Muay Thai. You know what I mean? Like, no, he's not in debt chicken biryani-wise. Um, I think Mike Davis is going to win this fight. I think he's another level on the feet to Natan Levy. It's, it's Natan Levy, like... It's risky. Uh, there's going to be some nasty Instagram comments if Natan Levy gets KO'd. That's all I know. Um, but Natan Levy, I've just never been impressed. Half a Garcia fight. He lost quite convincingly as well. Very close fight, actually. Pretty close fight. Uh, he beat Gennaro Valdez, but Gennaro Valdez was never all that. Mike Breeden he beat in a close decision as well, where he worked in takedowns. What are we looking at here? Three fights cancelled in 2023. Hasn't fought recently either. You know, I'm going to go Mike Davis, man. I think he's got the option to grapple. I think he's got the option to stand. And I think he's better in both regions. So I'm definitely going to go with Mike Davis. Getting this one done by... You know what? I'll say TKO in round one. I think he's going to be way too quick for Natan Levy and catch him straight on the fucking jaw side. So I'm going to go Mike Davis gets this one done by TKO. We move on. Up the card to another fight, which is... Let me check the time. All right, good. Gerald Mearshart. Versus Brian Barberena. What's Brian Barberena doing at middleweight? No idea whatsoever. Could he somehow beat Gerald Mearshart? You know what? I'm not above the idea of it. Welterweights typically are just better than middleweights. But we watched Brian Barberena in his last fight. And this is just as simple as I can cut it up, cut and dry. I'm going to go Mearshart round three. Just, cause, just for the meme of it. I don't know when he's going to win. But we'll say round three. Because he typically does get it done in round three. Almost finished Petrosky in round three as well. And arguably could have won that fight. Let's not forget. Um, but Gerald Mearshart. Brian Barberena. Brian Barberena just lost a fight to Mahmoud Muradov. By being out grappled. 13 takedowns Muradov got on him. 13 takedowns. He got out grappled by Muradov. Mirshar out grappled Muradov and, and exposed him. That was one of the OG fraud checks. That was one of the first times I think I've used the word fraud check was when Gerald Mirshar beat Mahmoud Muradov and got his takedowns and choked him out. So I'm going to say food chain of grappling. At some point, Mirshar gets dominant position over this melting vanilla ice cream that is Brian Barberena with not a single muscle insertion on his body. Sucks to be low T. Um, I'm going to go with Gerald Mirshar. High test. Alpha version of Jake Gyllenhaal. He gets it done by TKO. No. He gets it done by submission in the third round. Is what I'm going to go with. Sub, third round. Gerald Mearshart. GM3. We move on. Pani Kianzad versus Macy, Sa Macy Chasson. You know what? I actually was hesitating at maybe picking a Pani Kianzad pick here as an underdog. 
Because I don't mind it as an underdog. She did all right against Raquel Pennington, you know, if you rewatch that fight. She did all right against Raquel Pennington. But when you look at where this fight is likely to take place, it's going to be against the cage. If you've watched either of their fights, Pani Kian's had a Maisie Chasson, you'll know. And if you've watched their first fight they had, because this is a rematch, by the way, they fought on the Ultimate Fighter in the finale. And I watched that fight back. Um, if you've watched either of their fights, you know this fight is ending up against a cage. And it's going to be a clinch fest up against a cage. We know that. From watching the pair of them, I could say, well, you know, she looked good against Pennington, who's now champ. Or, you know, Chasson looked good against this one. Watch their first fight against each other, and you'll notice one thing. Chasson has way more options for what she can throw. Kianzad has no kicks whatsoever. She's purely a boxer. And she has a six-inch reach disadvantage here in the hands. <laughs> Chasson has more kicks, and I think that's something that she's massively improved in her game since their first fight. I can't visibly see that Kianzad has improved her boxing, but what I can say is that Chasson's stand-up has improved. What happened in their first fight? Chasson out-muscled Kianzad up against a cage. Chasson dropped Kianzad and then choked her out in round two. Now, there was a moment where Kianzad nearly got an armbar after Chasson dropped her. But Chasson then found the back, moved out of the way of the armbar, escaped it, and got the rear naked choke and sunk it in. Um, but the main thing, physicality will win this fight, in my opinion. That's another part of it. I think Chasson has the power advantage. She has the uh, option for strikes advantage in terms of her kicks. I think that's going to be a big difference here. She's massively improved them. Physicality advantage. What was happening in the first fight? What could we see physically? Chasson had the power. She had the kicks. And she was stronger in the clinch. I just don't see someone just overtaking someone in strength. Especially when Chasson is a massive bantam weight. Five foot nine. Very big for the division. Very long arms. Very strong for the division as well. Um, and she's a grinder with great cardio. She was on her way maybe to beating Irene Aldana before getting hit with that weird liver kick from bottom position. She outmuscled Norma the bakery herself, Diamant, against the cage. I know she got hurt in that fight, and I was screaming, finish her, Jamont, finish her. But she won that fight, very close. But she outmuscled Norma Jamont up against a cage in that fight. And Norma Jamont, she, like, she tenses those glutes and digs her balls of her feet into the, into the canvas. You ain't shifting that woman, okay? You ain't shifting that woman once she tenses those glutes and locks in. And Chasson was outmuscling her, and she was outmuscling Kianzad in their first fight anyway. So I, I just think if it ever comes down to a decision, I'm going to go Chasson for clinch control, Chasson for powerful shots, Chasson for kicks at range. She finished the last fight. She's going to be more confident going into this one. I'm going to go with Macy Chasson getting this one done by decision 30-27, 29-28. We move on. Up the card, Christian Rodriguez versus Isaac Dulgarian. I have been going back and forth on this fight for a long time. I want to pick Christian Rodriguez, but I am going to go with Isaac Dulgarian for many reasons. Please tell me I can find the info. I, I wrote down information about Isaac Dulgarian, and I'm going to bring it up for you guys right now. Give me a moment here, okay? Um, Isaac Dulgarian, Isaac Dulgarian. Here it is. Here's the information page that I've got for you. So, first of all, let's talk about the matchup, and I'll get to this page afterwards. Hope you guys appreciate the research I put into these these days. I want to be good at picks. Much better at picks than I am. Uh, Christian Rodriguez. Let's face it. We go through his career. Every fight has an asterisk. We can say that for every fight of his career. You could say that Dulgarian's never fought top-level competition. He fought Marshall, who was considered a great prospect, by the way. Francis Marshall was considered, like, watch out for this Francis Marshall guy. He was. And, uh... He lost his fight to William Gomez, and it kind of lost a bit of hype. But it was a decision. It was a close fight, you know. Uh, Isaac Dulgarian dominated him, took him down and beat him up bad and finished him in the first round. Light work. That's impressive to me. Christian Rodriguez, however. Good. Amazing survivability on the ground. Great counter and defensive wrestling. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why my thought process has swayed me towards Dulgarian. First of all, I think he's a bigger, stronger man. I just think he is. Christian Rodriguez, although he's failed so many times to make bantamweight, he can make bantamweight. I don't think Dulgarian ever could. 
He's wide at the shoulders. He's built like a monster for the division. And I think he will give um, a massive size difference. I think he will have a massive size difference compared to Rodriguez. Um, because this is his weight class, Dorgarian. This is his weight class. Rodriguez is now moving up to featherweight because, and we'll talk about this. I know this is a, almost a Duke Rufus type thing these days. Um, or throughout history. This guy can't make weight to save his life. Like, and he's, and he's ruined so many prospects for it as well. And it actually really pisses me off. So I hope Dolgarian smokes him. Even though I didn't mind the idea of picking uh, Christian Rodriguez. I kind of hope Dolgarian smokes him, to be honest with you. Let me try and find what I'm looking for here. So let's go through Christian Rodriguez real quick. He's on the regional scene. Has an amateur career. Iffy. A couple fights here and there. Nothing really too much to look at in the amateur career. Beats some schmucks in his first three fights. Gets a few fights cancelled. Uh, beats another schmuck. Beats another schmuck. Uh, Reyes Cortez on the contender series. Tracy Cortez's brother. Watch this fight. Sloppy fight. Clearly Christian uh, Rodriguez won the fight. Clearly he won the fight. He was acting like he had... He he was acting... Uh, So-and-so Cortez was acting like he had won that fight when it went to a decision. Reyes Cortez was acting like he'd won the fight. He hadn't. But he was fucking awful at fighting Reyes Cortez. And let's face it, the only reason he was on the contender series is because he's from the US. So he has to go, what, 5-1, and one, whereas Europeans have to go, like, 17-0. and 0. Um, And he was Tracy Cortez's brother. So the storyline was all there. Since he's lost to Peyton Tabbitt in the, uh, on the next time he went on the contender series, and he got smoked by Peyton Tabbitt, easily beaten as well. Um, Justin Hughes, he lost on the regional scene at three and four opponent. He lost to. Then he beat a six and ten opponent. He beat a six and ten opponent. Got a decision win against a three and O guy, and boom, he's back on the contender series against Christian Rodriguez. But one thing I need to point out, Christian Rodriguez, there's an asterisk next to every win. And he's had a size advantage over every opponent he's ever fought. Look through his career of Christian Rodriguez. And what you will find is his fight against Reyes Cortez, he missed weight for the contender series. So they didn't sign him. The UFC did not sign him. He then fights Ryan McIntosh. Want to know what happened? Catch weight, 150. Weren't making bantam weight there either. Was not making bantam weight there either. The guy that he ended up fighting was 19 and 36 that stepped in to take that fight. That guy was obviously not ready to make weight. That one's not entirely on Christian Rodriguez. It's not on Christian Rodriguez. He did what he did. A couple opponents fell out. The Jonathan Pierce fight, he takes on short notice at 145. I thought he looked great. This is his best performance against Jonathan Pierce. But did he take it on short notice? He just went into a training camp with Ryan McIntosh on the regional scene a month before this fight with Jonathan Pierce, and I think he took it on a few weeks' notice. So he was in shape, and he made 150 against McIntosh. So he was kind of big anyway. He wasn't, like, in shredded bantamweight shape. And then he's like, oh, I'm fighting at 145. He was like, okay, I'm weighing in at 150. I'm a big dude. All right, let me bulk on a little bit of muscle if I can, and we'll fight at 145 against Jonathan Pierce and translate this right over because the fight against McIntosh was not even a fight. It was a verbal stoppage immediately, pretty much, into the fight. So... Um, because the guy's 19 and 30 fucking six. Uh, Jonathan Pierce was struggling with Christian Rodriguez, chucking his head into guillotines, escaping them. Um, but Christian Quinn, uh, Rodriguez had an advantage on the feet, landing good shots there, tiring out uh, Jonathan Pierce. But Jonathan Pierce just kept hustling for takedowns, kept getting them at the right times. And I think barely edged out a decision. Um, the scorecards and the commentary of that fight suggest otherwise, but I think barely edged out a decision over Christian Rodriguez, who put up a great performance. But Joshua Weems, who? You get a win over him. All right, Weems gets a takedown on him, by the way. Important. Weems gets a takedown on him twice in that fight, then loses position and gets Anaconda choked. Um, Raul Rosas Jr. gets the takedown on him, has his back in round one, and he's trying to choke him out in round one so much he gasses his arms out, trying to re a choke three times through the jaw of Christian Rodriguez. And uh, Rodriguez starts bouncing back into the fight. What happened in that fight? Rodriguez missed weight massively again. He missed weight again for that fight. That's his third time under the UFC banner that he's missed weight. Then you look at his fight with Cameron Simon. Close fight. 
I don't think it was as close as people suggest. I thought Christian Rodriguez very clearly won that fight. I know a lot of people were saying, you know, close, close, 2-1, 2-1. You know, and Cameron Simon had his hands up at the end. I think Christian Rodriguez very clearly won that fight. I thought Cameron Simon looked a lot sloppier than we've seen him before in that fight. A lot sloppier than we've seen him before, especially with his boxing. And that's where we saw Christian uh, Rodriguez land a lot of clean shots in the boxing department. Um, But Cameron Simon was scrambling with him. And again, he misses weight by four pounds for that fight. Like, it really pisses me off, this guy. Because he's good, yeah. But it's not even like... He's missing weight because he's injured and he's awful looking in the fight. He looks good in the fights. Calm, composed, cardio for three rounds. No limp. Not, not, not punching with one hand. Like he's, he's in shape. He's good. And he just doesn't suffer to make the weight like the rest of them do. And he knows like Cameron Simons from South Africa. So he's not going to fly all the way to the US and go, oh, I'm not fighting if you miss weight by that much. This dude refuses to cut weight the same way everyone else does. And he's edging out these decisions. Dulgarian. Here's the difference maker here that I want to talk to you guys about real quick. Isaac Dulgarian. You guys want to hear a difference? Jonathan Pierce was a high school wrestler. He got knocked out viciously by a gym bully, blindsided by him, by the way, and badly slept, had his neck broken by this assault in the gym, his jaw broken, his teeth knocked out, his nose broken, something to do with his septum. He had a horrific horrific beating by some random steroid using gym bully in his gym and he dropped out of college and just just started an mma career but he did wrestle in high school um and he was able to take down christian rodriguez about a 50 percent clip in their fight but he did tire himself out doing it um you look at other people christian rodriguez has faced raul rosas jr before the fight said he had an hour of wrestling training in kazakhstan he had a kazakhstani coach who trained him for about not an hour a month um, and that's what he learned his wrestling from. And other than that, he just did grappling, freestyle grappling. He was able to get down Christian Rodriguez in round one and get his, get to his position against Christian Rodriguez. In round two and three, different story, I get it. Isaac Dulgarian has dominated every opponent he's ever been put in there with, including his test in the UFC, which he absolutely dominated as well and showed levels in comparison to other prospects in the featherweight division. Um... Not many great opponents on the regional scene, but he's beaten all of them and dominated all of them very, very easily by faking stuff on the feet and then blasting that double leg and ragdolling them, getting dominant position and beating them up. Um, what did I just say? Jonathan Pierce, high school wrestler, dropped out in college, started an MMA career. Uh, Raul Rosas Jr., a month of wrestling. He actually went back to Kazakhstan after that fight with... Uh, Christian, or Christian Rodriguez and trained another amount of wrestling with that uh, Kazakhstani coach that he had. Isaac Dulgarian. I've got his credentials right here. Um, he's an NCAA Division II wrestler and was a three-time state champion. By the way, I think this guy went to like a good school as well. I can't remember where. I think, I want to say like Notre Dame or, or some, I, I, something like that. It's a, it's a name of a school that I know of. So it must be something. Otherwise, I wouldn't know of the name of it. So it must be a good sporting school. Either way, NCAA Division II wrestler, three-time state champion in every style. In every style, he's a three-time state champion. In each style. Uh, NCAA Division II finalist as a true freshman and a six-time Triple Crown winner Winning state in all three styles is what I mentioned before. Um, dominant as an amateur and a pro. This this thing goes on to sort of hail him and, and, and like sort of talk up his grappling skill. And uh, I think that that's the difference in wrestling that we're going to see here in this fight against Christian Rodriguez. And you're giving Dolgarian a bit of a muscle advantage. Could Christian Rodriguez win if this fight goes on? Absolutely. I think he's a great underdog here. And um, I hesitated on maybe picking him because I think he's got good survivability and he might be able to survive Dolgarian. But I, I'd need him to finish after that. You know, I don't want to see him lose two rounds to Dolgarian or lose a round and a third or two thirds to Dolgarian and then try and make a comeback. He barely did much against Raul Rosas Jr. in his comeback against him. Barely did much. Not like he finished him. Not like he beat the hell out of him. He just got position over him and just sort of cruised to a victory in the second and third round. 
I didn't like the pace that he pushed there. I'm going with Dolgarian. I think he's going to have too much of an advantage in the physicality and the wrestling credentials. A night and day above Jonathan Pierce. Night and day above Raul Rosas Jr. I think he's going to translate that into MMA. Undefeated, bulletproof mindset. I think he wins this fight. We move on. Ovin St. Pru versus Kennedy and there's a Chukwu. I'm going with Kennedy and there's a Chukwu. Ovin St. Pru is in a feature fight of a UFC fight night card in 2024. I'm going with Kennedy and a Chukwu. I think he's going to KO Ovin St. Pru. Ovin St. Pru. This is what I don't understand about the UFC's business decisions. I'm going to look it up right now. Ovin St. Pru. I kind of want to know this. Maybe I'm not going to be able to see it and find it out immediately. But he makes a lot of money. Okay, this was a year ago. UFC uh, 2022. Uh, I'm not even looking into all of this. He makes a crazy amount of money. Like, I'm talking hundreds of thousands. Like, I think he makes, like, if he wins, he gets, like, 300K. If he loses, he gets, like, late 100 and something thousands. Like, 160, 150, something like that. He makes good money. And I don't know why they pay him. No one cares about him. Get rid of him. Like, this is where the UFC's fumbling the bag. They're paying these guys so much for nothing. Same thing with Arlovsky. Get rid of him. Nuzicic, who's going to absolutely chin him. Ovin St. Pru just got chinned by Felipe Linz. Chinned by Felipe Linz in round one. Do I need to say it again? His only win is against Shogun. And some people online thought Shogun won. He ain't putting out Shogun. I know Nuzicic, who's very, very chinny. He got KO'd by Tanabosa. He got KO'd by Jamal Hill. I, I just... He did get a KO over Alonzo Manyfield, which did age quite well. But... I'm going to swipe with Nuzza Chukwu. Youth, momentum, OSP's 40. I'm going to go Nuzza Chukwu gets a TKO win here. Although he is maybe the chinniest fighter in UFC history. I'm going to trust him to win against Ovin St. Pru in 2024. We'll see if I'm right though. We move on. Brian Battle versus Angelusa. You know what I like about Angelusa? He's very good. He's extremely good. Do I think he beats Brian Battle? I don't. I don't think he beats Brian Battle. I like Angelusa. He has a chin, yeah, which is so good in ways. But it's almost like he just it, his chin keeps him alive while no one's home. In moments in fights. You'll know what I mean if you watch back some uh, fights of Angelusa. Great chin. Like, he's not getting chinned by people out there. He's just not. But he gets hurt by shots, and he just stops doing everything. And just people start building up momentum on him. And I think Brian Barberena can build that momentum on him if he wants to. Brian Barberena is a very big welterweight. He's a very powerful welterweight. Dynamic welterweight. I know he got dominated by Renak Fakretinov, but he can grapple. And he's shown that in his recent two performances. He showed that against AJ Fletcher. Great scrambles there. Stayed in dominant position the entire time. One step ahead of AJ Fletcher the entire way through. And, and Ange Lusa, you look through some of his fights... Reese McKee fight, he's winning the fight, he's doing great, he's hurting McKee in certain moments, he's getting takedowns. I don't think McKee's UFC level, I don't think he ever will be. I think he's malnourished. Um, but McKee still hurt him badly in round three and nearly finished him. I don't like that. I really don't like that. And we can go through other fights in his career as well, because it's not just that one. We've got the AJ Fletcher fight that he had. I'm sure he nearly got finished in that fight as well. AJ Fletcher nearly had him out of there in that fight. He lost to Munir Lazares. Got schooled to a decision in that fight. Picked apart with one twos down the pipe. Basically the entire, entire fight long. It's actually a pretty fun fight to watch. Um, other than that, he got beaten up by JDM on the Contender Series, but had a good showing for himself. I, I just don't like this for him. I think he gets hurt too easily. Um, I think Brian Barberena has made easier work with opponents that he struggled with. And uh, I think Brian Barberena is just that next level above. Younger, way taller, got the reach advantage. Big, strong dude for welterweight. I think he mogs Angelusa, and I think he catches him on the chin at some point in this fight. And uh, I think that's going to be enough to where he maybe gets a takedown afterwards, or he just wins the fight by decision or TKO. So I'm going to go with Brian Battle getting this one done. I think he's that just slightly level above. That's a co-main event of a fight night, by the way. Main event, Taitui Vasa versus Marcin Taibura. You know what? I'm going to go with Taitui Vasa over Marcin Taibura. It's a tricky pick to make. Very close in odds. Very, very close in odds. Um, but I do think Taito Ivasa's got this one in the bag over Taibura. 
to Ivasa at this point in his career, think about the mindset that he's going to be in. We see Tyre, we think, you know, he definitely doesn't train that hard. He's drinking shoeys, he's doing beers, all this type of stuff. You get this idea that he's not putting his 100% into things. His career is now on the line. It's as simple as that. His career is 100% on the line. He's lost to Cyril Garn. He lost to Pavlovich. Brutal back-to-back, especially the Pavlovich one. And he's just recently been beaten by Alexander Volkov as well. I love his calf kicks, man. And I don't think I don't think Tybura's legs are built the same as Volkov's. Volkov's got great low kick defense. We t- he took away the low kick of Cyril Garn in their fight. Watch back the Volkov Cyril Garn fight. He took away the low kick of Cyril Garn. He took away the low kick of Aspinall. He was checking a few of them as well. Um, very good low kick defense, and still Tuivasa was getting through. I know the commentary was going too far with it, but even while Volkov was checking some of them, they were still hammering home and causing some damage on the on the calf of Volkov. And against Ty- to Tybura, who, by the way, got taken down by Volkov in their fight to the ground. Um, so I don't see him ragdolling uh, Tuivasa or anything. I think Tuivasa is maybe not got the greatest credentials in terms of takedown defense and technique. But what he does have is an ability to just get back up. He does that very well. He's very strong in those positions. And uh, Martin Tybura, I just think his calf's going to be finished in that first round. So I'm going to go with round two or one. KO. For Taito Ivasa, I like Marcin Tybura, but I know Tom Aspinall made him look like a fool, like he didn't even belong in there, but that's Tom Aspinall. He does that to every heavyweight pretty much, unless you gamrot his knee apart like uh, Curtis Blades. Tybura had a shitty uneventful fight with Blagoy Ivanov. I think I think Tuivasa is way better than Blagoy. And also Tybura tried one takedown in that fight. It's not like he's a grappler. He can grapple, but he doesn't. Even if he can, and he, if he should, he doesn't normally. And uh, I reckon Taito Ivasa, after a couple low kicks, he's going to be fighting a w- much worse version of Blagoy Ivanov. Um, and I think he's going to he's going to be fighting a much worse version of Martin Tybura. And that's where I think Taito is going to capitalize, chopping that calf early, and then start to bring it upstairs. I think Tybura is hittable. I don't like the way he covers up because Taito Ivasa does a really good job of finding uppercuts and hooks around the guard. Um, and Tuivasa does a very closed guard. It's not a high guard, like a Muay Thai guard like that. It's a very shut window guard. You know what I mean? He very much puts his hands right in front of his face and just uh, shuts off to the world sometimes. And I don't like that because he leaves openings for the uppercut and he leaves openings around the side of his guard as well. And that's where Tuivasa does his work against Struve, against Augusto Sakai, and many others that he's KO'd in his career. Um, I'm sure I'll find another example of one of them in a second. Uh... Let me find another example of it. Do, 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 do. But yeah, Tybura, I just don't think he's got the athleticism for Tui Vasa. I'm going to go Tui. He's lost a bunch. He just watched Tyson Pedro retire. Um, I'm going to go Tui Vasa getting this one done. I really am. He beat Derek Lewis up against the cage. Like, I, I think he beats Tybura. I really think he beats Tybura. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Toodle Pip. I'll see you later. And goodbye. He dropped Garn. If you can find the chin of Cyril Garn... I just believe you can find it on Tuiva, on uh, Tybura. Am I wrong? I don't think I'm wrong there. I really don't think I'm wrong. He found the chin of Garn, even after being beaten up for a round and picked up for a round. He found it. He dropped him. He failed to finish. Um, but I think if he can ever find it on Garn, he'll find it on Tybura. And he didn't even have the option to low kick Garn because Garn wins that game every time. Now he'll have the option to low kick. I'm going to go Tai Tuivasa. I'll say round one, TKO. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Toodle Pip. I'll see you later. Goodbye.